This is part one of our introductory presentation and lecture on how to read and analyze The Circle, which is the novel that we are reading in this class. This is Dave Eggers. He is our author. We're going to go over um, some of his influences and how this story is crafted. So, Dave Eggers uh, is a relatively well-known author. He has penned many books and articles. Um, some of them are fiction, some of them are nonfiction. He has covered a variety of different text types. In fact, there's rumor that he's in the middle of creating a graphic novel, which is something new and interesting for him. He is the founder of McSweeney's Internet Tendency, which is like a satirical website with uh, different writing styles featured and a few other things if you're interested. He's the recipient of multiple awards in the literary world, so he's relatively well known, I would say, and um, recognized for his talents. He's probably best known for and most awarded for his book called A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius, which is actually a memoir that he penned um, not too long after the events that happened. His parents died when he was in his early 20s, and as a result, he and his older siblings had to take care of their youngest brother. And a heartbreaking work of staggering genius uh, details the move that they undertook across the United States to go to San Francisco, where Eggers eventually settled and I believe still lives there today. The Circle, one of uh, many books that he has penned, was met with mixed success at its publication in 2013. So this novel is already six years old, and some of the points in it um, have proven to be kind of prescient or prophetic points. Things that Eggers warned us about, I guess, six years ago have come to pass. And there's also some moot or irrelevant things in the book already, which goes to show how fast the tech world moves. If you have started this book, which you should have by now, uh, you will know that it is about the pitfalls of big media and new media. So influences. Um, certainly George Orwell is a big influence in this book. I would say he's probably the biggest one. So if you are familiar with Orwell's 1984, the circle will resonate with you, especially with the slogans, these kind of paradoxical, contradictory slogans. War is peace um, kind of gets translated in Eggers' world to privacy is theft. Uh, love is hate or hate is love in the Orwell world gets translated to like secrets or lies. Um, really interesting um, drawing heavily on George Orwell. Aldous Huxley, uh, the author of Brave New World, is another influence um, on Dave Eggers. I would say um, Huxley's preoccupation with the pleasure seeking and the mindlessness that modernity brings us um, featured in Brave New World is also a concern shared by Eggers that people when they're given everything don't bother to think anymore and they just sort of pursue and pursue and pursue without stopping to ask if they should be doing that. Uh, Althusser and his philosophy of interpolation is also present in this book. Althusser um, is, a, is a, philo a French philosopher a fairly modern one, um, who posited that there is no original or authentic action, that we are always and already interpolated or kind of subsumed by a larger uh, force or a larger institution. So um, we act the way that we act because we are interpolated and sort of um, kind of like puppets, you know, like someone's pulling our strings and we have no real say in what we do or where we go, especially when things exert power over us. And we'll see that the circle is one of those institutions that exerts a lot of power. Uh, Jean Baudrillard is um, another philosopher that I think his ideas are present in this novel. And his is the philosophy of the simulacrum. Um, the simulacrum, a really good example of this is like Disneyland, right? Disneyland is not authentic at all. When you go to Disneyland and you ride the Matterhorn, you are not in Switzerland, you are in Anaheim. But it's a simulation of the Matterhorn experience, right? When you go to visit the Haunted Mansion, you're not in New Orleans, but you're in a place that's supposed to simulate New Orleans for you. And Baudrillard's philosophy um, permeates into everyday life, saying that everything is sort of a simulation of something else, that we never really arrive at what we call the real. And in the world of technology, we often talk about the simulated experience being on par with or in competition with 
the so-called real experience of real life. In fact, we even have an acronym, IRL, that gets at this idea that there's the simulated world of the world online, and then there's the quote-unquote real world. Uh, Baudrillard, of course, would say that there is no such thing as the real world, that everything is a simulation of something else. And so May and the circle will continuously pursue the simulacrum and then have these moments where she breaks into the real and then she gets sucked back in. She's sort of interpolated, getting back to Althusser, back into the simulacrum, which is the circle. So that by the end of the book, she is convinced that like the simulation of the experience of being online is the same as, as living the way that you live day to day. So concerns raised by the novel and arguments. These are really important because you will likely have a midterm question that focuses on one of these things. And this is what you should pay attention to as you read the book. Reading fiction, um, especially in an English class, can sometimes feel either like a chore, you know, it's this thing that I have to do, or it's the opposite. It's this like pleasurable moment in the middle of the semester where you don't really have to pay that much attention. Um, I would say that you need to read this with a particular like lens over your eyes, like like turn your senses on when you read this book. You're not reading passively, you're reading actively to pick up on these ideas and look for them. They have to be inferred um, as you read it. So shifting definitions of reality is the big one. What is real and what is not? This book will continuously ask you to determine what big media and new media does to mess with our sense of the real. What happens when the virtual world is the same as the so-called real world? Um, and we continuously have these discussions today about things like cancel culture or about uh, like doxing online, right? The real world is something that we usually try to separate from the world of like Twitter. And then on Twitter, we behave the way that we behave. And in the real world, we behave how we're going to behave. But if we behave badly on Twitter, the real world has decided in some cases that that is the same as misbehaving in the here and the now. So a really good example of this is like petitioning to have a company shut down because, um, you know, they hold opinions that are incorrect. And so online they're there, but in the real world, everything is copacetic. When we blur the definition and we blur the line between one thing and the other, we end up with a world that is hyper real in this kind of paradoxical uh, sense. The second uh, thing that I would say is really important in this novel is this idea of the limitations of human knowledge. Um, something that informs the progress of the circle or the way that it you know, pursues its aims is that it, it's doing it in the pursuit of knowledge and knowing more. And this is always a virtue, right? I mean, you're in a classroom right now, you're enrolled in school, of course you're supposed to be pursuing knowledge, but Eggers wants us to ask what is knowable, what is unknowable, how does knowledge influence the idea of perfectibility might be another thing to ask. And that's a really important question because the book says, or the, the people in the book say, that when we know more, we are more perfectible. But Eggers will constantly check us to remind us that maybe humans are not perfectible at all. And therefore, the pursuit of knowledge is kind of in vain, that we really can never know anyone or anything fully. <clears throat> Authenticity versus the script itself. Can people live and act authentically when they are under surveillance is what uh, Eggers will continuously ask us as well. Um, this is something that's been written on a lot in literature, especially as it relates to power structures of the state. So a good example of living authentically, perhaps, versus a scripted self is if you're driving through a speed trap and you know it, so you're going the exact speed limit. You're not going the exact speed limit because you recognize that it's an ethical and moral thing to do, and you're being a very safe driver. If, especially if you know you're in a speed trap, you're going the speed limit because you know you might be being watched. And that's not exactly like an authentic demonstration of the good. And, and Eggers will ask us as a result, can we really be good people and can morality exist if we are compelled to be moral at all times? Um, another interesting kind of concern in this novel is that there are changes in religious worship as a result of the world of technology um, and that we have kind of a god of modernity. And, and Eggers will cast that god perhaps as ourselves and, and that the worship of the self is a natural result of 
technological media progression. So who or what is that God of modernity and what has happened to any being beyond the self? Uh, when we don't see anything bigger than ourselves, what happens to the human is what Eggers um, is really interested in in this book. So there's all these interesting religious motifs and images, kind of themes. Um, if you've started the book already, you know that there are three wise men in this, in this novel as they're um, colloquial refer colloquially referred to. The first line of the book is, my God thought made this is like heaven. Um, so pay attention to that, especially if you're interested in how religion is shaped uh, in the modern world. And of course, privacy versus openness. This is a big one, obviously. Um, you can tell already, I'm sure, in your reading of the book that Eggers will ask if there's such a thing as a private identity in a world of public openness and what happens to the self when it's always, always, always performing and always public. Um, when it's constantly being recorded, when it's constantly talking about itself on the internet, when it's constantly interacting with other people on the internet, is there such a thing as a private moment? And if so, what's the significance of that private self? What happens, is it immolated perhaps, when the demand for the public identity supersedes any notion of privacy? And of course, individuality versus collective thought. This is a really important one also. All of these are important, that's why they're bulleted. <clears throat> what becomes of the individual when the collective dominates cultural values? Can anyone exist as an individual, self-reliant, self-assured, independent, autonomous, when there is this group identity that gets shaped as a result of our activities online? May's sense of personal self diminishes less and more and more throughout the novel and she becomes less and less herself and more and more something else is part of the collective, um, the more time she spends at the circle sort of being interpolated in. All right, so this ends part one of the lecture on the circle. Uh, please stay tuned for part two and uh, we will continue going on through some of the bigger things with genre that are happening in this book as well.